Hey coaches, sorry for the late wad tips. Um, the day just gets ahead of me as always. Uh, kipping pull-up practice. For many, uh, especially those who can't do this unassisted, it's just uh, it's a great review and practice to keep doing what we've been doing on Monday and Tuesday. I've seen already a huge benefits and gains to what we've been doing, and, and I'm glad we were kind of repeating this. I may honestly just copy and paste uh, what we did and doing this week into the next pulling uh, practice. Um, ultimately, you know, I give a disclaimer that uh, none of this matters if they're not strong enough to do pull-ups. There's no miracle drill that we can provide for them um, if they don't have a few strict pull-ups on their own to do kipping pull-ups. With that said, we can still apply practice these drills to apply so as their strength goes up, their body fat goes down, they'll be better equipped for that moment, right? That aha moment when they first, they get their first uh, RX kipping pull up. Uh, but again, as I said, once they get that first chin to bar, the next thing is congrats. All right, now it's chest to bar. When they finally get that, congrats. Now it's bar muscle up. And then when they get that, congrats, it's ring muscle up. So we got to keep encouraging progress more than anything. Uh, there's no such thing as RX, right? I truly believe that because the standards keep going up. The level of athleticism keeps going up. So once we believe that people finally arrive at a certain movement is when they stop growing. Um, so for uh, our RX athletes, we are trying to apply the principle of continuous uh, motion through the kip, right? Anyone can perform one kip, but can you put two and three and four together? That's where the push away is paramount. Keep the numbers small so they get a lot of good quality sets in as well. Uh, the, the chest to bar, really the difference between the chest to bar and the chin to bar is a two to three inch differential. And really the main difference here is that they have to drive the chest uh, contact to the bar is an effect. It is not a cause. It is an effect of an athlete being able to pull harder by punching their elbows behind their ribs. That's how we get to that position. It is not think about the chest and hopefully I get up there because one of the things the chinda bar uh, endorses indirectly a bad habit, which is pull just enough to get your chin over a bar. Uh, and most of the time, uh, that doesn't require an athlete to really drive their elbows behind their ribs. From a coaching perspective, all I'm looking for on a chest bar is does an athlete understand how important it is to drive their elbows all the way behind their ribs? That's how you get a chest bar. Uh, the muscle snatch, uh, the focus here today is uh, a high pull turnover. That's what we're looking for that the athlete understands the concept of high pull, almost brushing the bar to their chest, and that the turnover, the lockout, is aggressive to the finish. The finish is shoulder blades. I did this drill that I made up where I hold them. Um, I really like just holding athletes in these really awkward positions as I talk because I kill two birds with one stone. So I'm forcing a tough position for them in an isometric hold and I get to educate them versus them put the bar down and be bored to death. Here they really have to focus on the position and me at the same time. Shoulder blades and shoulders are two different things. Um, shoulder blades is synonymous with base of the neck, right? We kind of use those two, but what's happening is athletes are barely making even that position possible and they're staying over shoulder. That one inch differential in a power snatch and definitely in a squat snatch at heavy loads, they're gonna miss it every time. So really over exaggerate that. So I'd put them in the shoulder, a bar over shoulder position, press, 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 press really hard, and I would slowly make them bring that bar forward so they can feel how awkward that is. The further away in front of them they bring that, the more awkward it goes. So then I bring them back to shoulder blades, they're comfortable again. Then I slowly force them to bring that bar behind them a few inches and they feel how awkward that is. It makes the shoulder blades feel uh, like a joke in comparison. So they really just need to understand what sh over the shoulder blades feel like. Um, when we do the muscle snatch with the various videos that I've shared and I'll share a couple with you, uh, they don't encourage that the athlete uh, bring the bar in to their thigh and definitely not the hip. Uh, I didn't hear a lot of explanation, but it's my understanding that when they brush it that hard and close uh, into the pocket, they create too much friction and it slows down the power snatch. The power snatch in itself is already limited, and so they're just making it worse. 
uh, to the other thing I, I think that's important here is that by not brushing the bar into their hips they get to stay over the bar a little bit longer and really snap their hips open so uh, there there are four things that I cued uh, as they drive into a, a really strong muscle snatch and that is squeeze your quads squeeze your butt high pull lock out squeeze your quads squeeze your butt high pull lock out it's in that order that it happens if you do it smoothly and swiftly you get that little click of the bar at the end I call that a click of speed that click of speed is very very uh, an effective tactile cue I don't even have to look at the athlete and have them perform that if I hear that click occur I know there's enough speed in there right because that the, the click is the collars of the barbell making that sound because it's reversing uh, it, the 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 bar collar is clicking into the bar because they maximally hit that overhead shoulder position really fast and it makes that clicking sound. So uh, we, I love that sound and I, and I think it's one that we should endorse, right? That a lot of this these things right here, especially with the muscle snatch, is promoted and done well through speed. With the box jump overs, because it was pouring rain all morning, we moved the 100 meter dumbbell farmer carry jog into a one minute double under. Uh, we believed we were able to preserve the stimulus with that substitution because that's approximately the intensity and the duration that it was going to take to do that. Coincidentally, the push press became a pre exhaust for the double unders, and those who uh, can perform double unders fresh had. Uh, some struggles here for those that aren't efficiently rotating the wrist and predominantly uh, rotating the rope uh, with too much shoulder. So there was some uh, frustration going on there with their double unders. And, you know, ultimately the paradox here is that to get better at double unders, you have to try to completely rest your upper body while you're completely exhausted. And so uh, that was just a great reminder uh, today when I coached that. So the workout, 21 box jump overs. Um, again, coaches, I think we should all hold a standard in which the athlete um, jumps regardless. Um, even if it's on a 10-pound rubber plate, we want them jumping. If they're not in physical pain, it doesn't cause them pain. There's no reason why they shouldn't jump on something. Uh, plyometrics, jumping, is completely different than box step-ups. Absolutely can different skills. It's like... Uh, doing the bench over the deadlift. They're just doing two different things. So we want them jumping, okay? And we want to make that clear why we're doing it. Don't just tell them why. Just tell them what the ultimate purpose of the jump over is. Um, so, and, you know, I offered a lot of techniques. I don't think there's one way to do the box jump over. I know five box jump over techniques. We want to show them all, give them opportunity to practice, and choose the one that's most efficient. What we're trying to control above all else with all the box jump over techniques is that they are not shuffling their feet a lot to come on, uh, to get on the box, when they come down on the box, to turn around and jump back up. We want to build efficiency. I like to imagine that the ground is hot lava. We want to get those athletes off the ground as fast as possible on every single rep. Push presses, uh, you know, what's really nice from that transition from the muscle snatch is that if the loads are heavy on that muscle snatch, I'm okay with an athlete trying to go for three strong muscle snatches and realize that they can only get two really well and the third is just not worth attempting. That's a solid muscle snatch. I know because they tried to go for three and they just couldn't do it. That weight is approximately a good working weight for the workout. It's a good working weight for the workout, for the push presses. Uh, and so we quickly transition after muscle snatches into push presses because the bar is already set up, the weights are already on the bars, and we can do uh, some quick reviews of the push presses. And then the one minute double unders, the, the, the way to explain this is like, is once you finish your push presses and you grab your rope, look at the clock, we run both clocks for, uh, for convenience for the members throughout the gym, uh, add one minute from there, and then attempt double unders. We want all athletes attempting double unders. Uh, the only reason they wouldn't, if it's it causes them pain, for them, uh, you know, I believe that um, if a double under is causing them pain, the single under should be causing them pain too. And if it's not, then it's a landing mechanic of the double under, right? Ultimately, um, this sounds crazy, but 
I don't like training double owners anymore because they don't have a, you know, a cardiovascular effect for me because my double under looks like my single under. It's a low jump. It's a fast wrist rotation. And so they don't elevate heart rate. And at the top 1% for those athletes doing all those double unders, they make it look effortless because it is. It doesn't waste any energy. So if it's wasting them energy, we know it's an inefficiency of technique. And it's just something they're going to have to build. Uh, in the beginning, all athletes jump high and they over rotate. Uh, but over time, they want to build efficiency without having to exhaust themselves so much. For athletes that do have double unders, but they're just very inconsistent, we really wanted to encourage them to strategize how they're going to hit the doubles. Hey, I have one minute. What can I, how many sets can I do consistently well, unbroken in a minute? You know, if it's three by 20 double unders, that's what they're shooting for in that minute. If it's three by 10 double unders with rest in between, that's what they're shooting for. So it's a strategy within a strategy of the workout and that's really really important we can't go blind especially into double unders uh, because it's such a frustrating exercises exercise once you lose it um but it was it was, it was good man there were some great talking points i used the opportunity during the breakout session uh lately to really just kind of go over an overview of what i saw that i really like some things to consider for the athletes to work on and i just really give use an opportunity to uh to encourage them so uh, across the board, some really great classes today. I hope that helps coaches. Have a great day.